Welcome to the 12th episode of the podcast. This is your proprietor, Tony Ortega, coming to you from an undisclosed location deep inside the interior of the Earth's crust, otherwise known as the Underground Bunker. This week, we're coming back around to why we created the Underground Bunker to begin with. In 2012, we began working on a book that eventually gained the title, The Unbreakable Miss Lovely, and we created our website in order to make sure the book had an audience when it came out in 2015. That book, of course, was about Paulette Cooper and the incredible length Scientology went to in its attempts to try to destroy her career and ruin her life. Why? Well, because Paulette was a journalist who had dared to write one of the first books exposing L. Ron Hubbard and his dangerous organization. She endured years and years of harassment and dirty tricks operations that became legendary in the field. And all of that you can read about not only in our book about Paulette, but now she has a book of her own that you should read, and we wanted to talk to her about it here at the podcast. Paulette Cooper, wow, it is always such a delight. It always puts me in a great mood to talk to you. Aww. You're just wonderful to chat with. How 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 are you doing? Oh, we're doing great here. Got a new puppy. There a new puppy. A new puppy. A rare breed called a Miki dog. So it's we call him Peaky the Miki, and he is a terror. <laughs> and uh, you are down in Florida as usual. Yes, we are. Because I know you travel a lot and. Uh, Sometimes it's hard to catch you, but I'm glad to hear you're home right now. Right. Well, because of COVID, we didn't do so much traveling this year. And uh, everyone's healthy? Yes, and we're all healthy. That's great. So, Paulette, uh, what I'm really excited about is uh, you have put out your own version of your story, and you got to cover more subjects than uh, we did in, in my book about you. Uh and it's got this wonderful big title. Please spell it all out for the audience. What is the title of your new memoir? The Perils of Paulette. My life as a stowaway, tabloid reporter, travel writer, Scientology basher, Holocaust survivor, and more. And, you know, that's a big title, but it, it delivers. I mean, you, you, you've, you've lived such an amazing life. I mean, this was one of the things that, you know, we go way back, and I was just always stunned the more I looked into things about your life, how many different things you've done, how many different things you've succeeded at, how much has been thrown at you, and, and maybe more than anything is your resiliency. And I think people, and that's the number one question people ask me, is how have you managed to do so well when so many people have tried to do such terrible things to you? Well, it was not easy. During There were 15 years that I was pretty much the only person speaking out against Scientology, trying to help people who were having problems with them. And that was a really, really rough time. But then fortunately... Two years later, I met some wonderful man, and I married him. The dog is growling in the background. <laughs> and I married him, and uh, he's wonderful, and he's made my life very happy. Excuse me, honey, would you maybe pick up Peaky so, uh, <laughs> or, or, <laughs> or go up front to the, um, what do you call it, the front porch maybe and take him? <laughs> he growls when he wants Paul to throw the uh, ball. He, he's three pounds. Three pounds. He's three pounds, and he's an absolute terror. He just tells us what he wants to do all the time. He's really cute, though. And, uh, of course, you're speaking about Paul Noble. The... Yes. Who has a very interesting background himself, by the way, starting as, <laughs> starting as Eleanor Roosevelt's TV producer and uh, working with people like JFK. And has won five Emmys, and he's a very interesting guy. And he has his own book too, called "My First Eighty Three Years." And that's what I love about him: his sense of humor is just <laughs> unsurpassed. <laughs> yes, he's he really is. He's he's very funny. We went to a, a shop, the a, a restaurant the other night, and we had tilapia, and someone says, well, 
how do you make tilapia? And Paul says, first you catch the fish. <laughs> <laughs> and I love the story. One of the things I, I, I'm glad I got to tell in the book was that um, you had known Paul before all of the Scientology stuff happened. So that years later, when you met again, and just, you know, thought about dating him, you, you, you know, you had to be so careful. You, and so many of these people would approach you and it turned out to be they were working for Scientology and, and you were the subject of operation after operation. But you, you had known Paul before and that, and that made a big difference, didn't it? It did because they were trying all the time to get to me and, and succeeded to some degree because I ended up living with a guy that I didn't know was a Scientologist. And even after that, it was a constant thing where they they would introduce me, I would meet somebody, and then I'd find out that they were secretly working for them. And that was true even up to a few years ago, and who knows right now. I think things are okay. But I had dated Paul when I was younger, I was 25 years old, and when I started taking on Scientology, and then I met him 19 years later, two years after, I stopped exposing Scientology, and I knew that he was probably okay. He, <laughs> he always kids me and tells me he's in deep cover. But. That's right. He's working on the long game there. <laughs> so I could trust him, but it was very hard. I couldn't date for years because they were always trying. I mean, they tried directly through me. They even tried through my mother. They had somebody follow her to the beauty parlor and sit next to her and tell her about this wonderful son of hers that I should meet. And of course, the guy was a Scientologist. So that was my life for a long time. And even now when strangers try to contact me or people want to Facebook me, if I don't know them, I just have to assume the worst and I, I don't get involved. And just for those few people who may not know who you are, I know it's hard to believe anybody at the <laughs> Underground Bunker wouldn't know. But just for those few people, Paulette Cooper was a magazine journalist who was among the first people to write a book about Scientology uh, back in 1971, The Scandal of Scientology. And even before the book came out, well, after you had just written a magazine story in 1969, Scientology put together an incredible and elaborate set of operations to try to destroy you, to try to get you to commit suicide, to get you, uh, you know, convicted of a federal crime for years and years and years. And one of the things that made my life easier as a writer was that so much of this Scientology itself wrote down. I mean, they, they recorded all these operations against you. And from 1969 to 1985, they were heavy, they were constant, there was one after another. And uh, in those documents, they they had such an enmity to you for you, and they didn't they wouldn't even use your name in the documents. They called you Miss Lovely, and that's why the title of my book is The Unbreakable Miss Lovely. Um, but like you said, even as you and I were working on things, we found new operations that had been going on just recently. I mean, it's incredible how much they've been keeping an eye on you and trying to really wreck your life. Uh, and that's why, you know, I was so interested in writing your story is it's just incredible. And let me ask you this question, because people ask me all the time. Why do you think L. Ron Hubbard personally had such a vendetta at, aimed at you? What was it about you that drove them crazy, Paulette? Well, at that time, we're talking 1972, 73, there was nobody else speaking out against them. There was nobody helping people. The, they used to rob some, the office, say, of a reporter and find that in his notes he had been talking to me. And I was everywhere. So they became really upset, and they decided to put their entire, they called it the Guardian's office in those days. Now it's, I think, B1. Everything they could to shut me up. And as my husband will tell you, he can never shut me up. But they sure, <laughs> they sure came close because they wrote themselves bomb threats and had me arrested. And at one point, I was up for 15 years in jail because nobody believed 
that it was Scientology who had written the letters to themselves and called the FBI and said that they thought I did it. And it wasn't until five years later when the FBI raided Scientology that they found these documents about what they had done to Miss Lovely, which was their code name for me. Of course, they really meant Miss Horrible. And, <laughs> right. And then uh, finally was exonerated all those years later. Yeah, I mean, that's one thing that's so remarkable about all this was that um, at the time, 72, 73, they were trying to get you put in prison. Um, part of the problem was that when you tried to explain to people that there's this church yeah. using spies to try mm -hmm. to destroy me, it sounded insane. Right. But then five years later, like you said, in 1977, there was this big raid by FBI and among the hundred of thousand documents they took away from Scientology's records were these these operations against you spelled out and you were completely exonerated and not not just operations against you but operations against people like the Clearwater mayor Gabe Cazares and other people just these elaborate I mean at one point they they had actually groomed a woman to be your double and uh, was supposed to look like you. And then I remember you told me that that from some things your friends told you about calls they got, they had actually developed a woman who sounded like you. They they had developed a, a, an audio double. Right. And that person was supposed to go around and make bomb threats at local stores so that they would then think the police would think, well, I already had a, quote, record because they had already had me arrested for it. And that the police would believe that I was the one. And by the way, in those documents that you're talking about, that's how I found out that the guy that I had lived with five years earlier was a Scientologist. It turned out that he was keeping a diary, calling in every day when I wasn't around about what I was doing. And one of the entries read, uh, today she's talking about suicide. Wouldn't that be great for Scientology? Of course, I was talking about suicide because I was going to stand trial for, a, I had 15 years in jail over my head for a crime I did not commit. And most people thought, well, you know, she's a writer. She lives kind of a crazy life. And these people, this is a church. So she must have just gone off the deep end, <coughs> excuse me, gone off the deep end and uh, and snapped. And this this wasn't just a, a Scientologist that was that had moved in with you. This guy was a former Vietnam combat helicopter pilot He's got some. who, after the war, had gone to work for Scientology as a spy. Mm -hmm. And um, I found documents about, uh, well, firsthand testimony from somebody that was with him, that uh, years earlier he had been uh, helping to break into uh, lawyers' offices in other parts of the country. This guy was an operative, and he was introduced to you by someone else who was a Scientologist as just, you know, do you, you need a roommate? He'll, he'll help you pay the bills. Mm -hmm. And he lived with you for several months, and like you said, he was keeping a diary. He was reporting, probably reporting back to Scientology every day about yeah, what you – because it wasn't enough that they wanted to – get you indicted they wanted to try to make you suicidal they wanted to hear about it every day right yes and they wanted to know how successful they were but also one of the things he would do is he would say she's going to be wearing her yellow dress today so that it would make it easier for somebody else to follow me to see where i was going and who i was meeting it's incredible so there were, yeah there were a lot of reasons why he did that so but also, I believe that it was to get me to uh, kill myself. He used to go up to the roof every night. We had a rooftop pool where I lived, and he used to try to get me to go up with him. Of course, later I found out that there was a payphone up there, and that's where he was making his calls and calling him what I was doing. But also, he was a very gutsy guy, and it was just a very, very small ledge there, 33 stories up. And he used to try to get me to come up there with him. He'd st stand on the ledge and say, come on, you know, if you, if you won't do this, how are you going to have the strength to fight those bastards in court? And happily, I was in such a terrible state psychologically that I would not go up with him. I wouldn't trust anyone. 
and I did not do that, but I, I believe that that was probably an attempt to push me over, because it would have been very easy, and I was so depressed at that time, of course, facing 15 years in jail for what I didn't do, and facing a huge trial that would have been very heavily publicized, and it all seemed like it, it wasn't worth it to me anymore to live, and it would have been so easy standing on that ledge for him to just give me the slightest push, and I would have gone down 33 flights. Incredible. Something that still gives me nightmares. I'm sure. And, you know, they were trying so many other things, too. I mean, mm. I, I remember how shocked I was to find out, uh, because that, the story of, you know, Jerry Levin living in your apartment with you and reporting to Scientology, that was fairly well known when we started working together on your story. But um, then there was the whole Richard Bast thing, right? Yeah. Later, uh, they pulled a completely different operation on you where a private investigator pretended that he was trying to expose Scientology and you didn't know at the time that he was actually working for Scientology in order to get you to help him find out who was, you know, digging up dirt on the church. Right. Plus they... They tapped my phone. He paid for, I, I was in Washington, D.C. to uh, look through these documents that we're talking about. And he paid for me to have a room at the uh, Washington Hilton. And, of course, I found out afterwards that it was taped and that everything I said was taped and videoed and very much used against me because they were suing me. They sued me 19 times all over the world. And I had to support all these suits myself. But I also counterclaimed on three of the suits. And they wanted information as to what I was doing legally. So they even offered a lawyer friend of mine $10,000 just to that he should record me also when I discuss legal matters. Amazing. And uh, I don't know. It just seems to me like year after year this would have worn down anyone but it seemed like it, it kind of made you more determined than ever to expose them yes because all these people see after i wrote my book this which was really the first major expose of scientology after i wrote the book people started coming to me and saying you know but my son is in scientology and his life is ruined and lawyers were coming to me and saying how people were being sued and that they didn't have information and reporters were coming to me and saying, I need help on a story. And there was nobody else to go to. So I felt that I kind of had to do this. Yeah, and, and you made such a difference. I mean, it, all the major stories that were happening then were, you know, at least quoting you, if not, you know, consulting you. Um, and, I, and I gave them people, for example, if, if a local reporter was doing a story, then they needed to know, find some local person who had been a Scientologist. And I knew everything that was going on because everybody came to me. So that's what I spent 15 years as really the, you see, there was no internet. I know young people do not understand that there was a period of time, <laughs> but there was no internet. So people, it was like I was the internet for Scientology. There had to be somebody that knew what was going on and could help other people and lead them to other people. And that is what I was doing for many years for free. And it was it made life very, very difficult. But I did help a lot of people. And I still to this day get emails from people who tell me that I got they got out because they read my book or because I helped somebody or so it, I still get satisfaction out of that, although it's kind of unhappy to remember those years when I was writing my memoirs. It really was very rough to relive a lot of that, especially that uh, the Dick Bast, the spies. That was the hardest part because you want to believe the best of people. You don't want to believe that behind your back they're trying to harm you. And that's what I was learning about people that I knew. And... You know, you try not to lose faith in people, but when that keeps happening, sometimes it's hard. Oh, I definitely remember when we were going through that, 
uh, for Miss Lovely that, you know, those were tough t times for you to talk about. I, we would have to like, uh, you know, space it out because mm -hmm. I know it was very difficult for you to think about, particularly that time 72 to 73 when you were under indictment. Right. And and every day you worried that, okay, today is the day it's going to show up in the New York Post, you know, and right. my life is over, you know, right. Right. and that was just wearing you down. And you can see it in the photographs at the time. It was just awful for you. Well, when I when I wrote my memoirs, which you know, basically just came out, I wrote around that. I wrote all about, you know, how I successfully stowed away on an ocean liner when I was young and how. You know, I had become a tabloid writer mainly to pay for the incredible legal bills that I had. But I met a lot of celebrities and had a good time with that. So I wrote my book around the Scientology section, which is a quarter of the book. And then I wrote around the, when I say I wrote around, I mean, I wrote everything but. I could not bring right. myself. And then finally, when I realized I had a really interesting book, but I would have to discuss this important part of my life. I wrote everything except the Jerry, the guy that I lived with, and this detective that we're talking about, Dick Bass. I wrote everything but. And then finally, I just took a deep breath and said, okay, for the next few weeks, you have to do this section. You cannot write a book about your life and leave out something as important as these terrible betrayals that I underwent. When you were, when you were going back over things and – uh, you were looking at these other parts of your life, stowing away, uh, working on the, the uh, tabloid, uh, not just writing about celebrities, but also dating some celebrities. Uh, and, and then, you know, meeting Paul and your life with Paul and then all these other books you've written later. Was, when you were going over this for your own book, were you surprised at some of the things that – you know, when you wrote about them and thought about them again? I think it's, writing a memoir, I think it's very difficult because you really do have to face a lot of very painful things that you would rather forget. So, but, you know, I had a lot of happy times too. So I did write about that. I, I did, as you say, date a number of, and also interview a number of famous people. And then I did a lot of travel writing. So I traveled all over the world and mainly to get away from what was going on. So that part was fun. So there were, there were happy times. It was not all miserable. <laughs> Just those 15 years. <laughs> but there was another difficult part of your life. And, and, and when we, you know, I had first heard from you, gosh, in the late 90s. And then we finally got to meet for the first time, I think around 2010 in Manhattan, and of course I had been focused on the Scientology stuff, but then I remember we, we had breakfast and um, I think I brought up your childhood. Oh, I know what it was. You, you, when you were in Manhattan and you and I met for the first time, you had also been spending time with your sister who lives in New York. Mm -hmm. And I asked you, you know, what have you, you know, what's, what have you two been you know, talking about? And that's when you told me that we were trying to remember some things about our childhood that we're not sure about. And that made me very intrigued. And that's when we started really hunting down some facts about your first few years, which are incredible. You were born in Nazi-occupied Antwerp, and both your parents uh, were killed at Auschwitz, and you weren't sure how you survived. And we then, uh, I mentioned that in a Village Voice story that got picked up overseas, and we began hearing from some really interesting people in the Netherlands who remembered you and told us and helped us fill in some details, uh, an incredible story about how you and Susie, your sister, were scheduled to be on a train to Auschwitz when uh, you weren't you you didn't end up on it and the and the theory that we were working on was that bribes had been paid and these nazi uh guards were so corruptible that they were able to save your life and get you into an orphanage you were then in a series of orphanages before you came to new york and just incredible stuff that you and i managed to put together
But then since my book came out, you've you've discovered much more about that. You've actually uh, reunited with some people. And tell, can you tell me a little bit of how much of that is in your new book? Yeah, I reunited with, I met the man whose father bribed the Nazi guard at the camp that I was in to, to let me out and also my sister out. And I met him. And now they, there has been... There's been a group of people we've gotten together. We've uh, been on the phone, on Zoom this year who were all in some of the same orphanages that I was in. And one of them, in fact, uh, I have pictures with him. And then I, I tracked down two of my best friends from the orphanage. One had died. One had unfortunately had a very bad accident and had become quadriplegic. But it still filled in a lot of holes that I had for the first six years of my life. Then I was happily adopted by a wonderful family, the Coopers, and I became an American. And it really is related, though, to my fight against Scientology, because I saw the Scientologists as a semi-Nazi group, <laughs> a very fascistic group. And I felt that if in the 30s more people had spoken out against Hitler, what happened to my parents and six million Jews would not have happened. So that I really felt that even though I was paying a very bad personal price for it, I felt that I could not just walk away from a group that was doing as much damage and evil as Scientology was. And, and they were actually worse in those years, if one can imagine such a thing. Although I'm often very upset to hear that they're still doing a lot of the same dirty things, uh, still going after people like you, Tony, and Leah Remini, and uh, Mike Rinder. And it's really sad that they haven't changed over the years. They are using some of the same techniques. I would say yeah. the biggest difference yeah. is uh, when they were running these operations against you, mm -hmm. they tended to be carried out by... Scientologists that were working in the Guardian's office. They were young. They were very indoctrinated. They were very uh, dedicated to Scientology. And they really thought of you as this horrible enemy that threatened Scientology. And so they were fully invested in trying to bring you down. And I'm, I mean, I've talked to some of these people since then, and they have, they, have, they admit this, that this is one of the things that surprised me the most, Paulette, when I was working on, on the book. I, I, I really tried hard to actually contact some of these people who had run these operations against you. I had some limited success. And, of course, the most wonderful was Len Zinberg, who felt terrible that he had volunteered for some time in those operations. And he apologized to you. He was a great guy. But I ran into some of these people who were not apologetic, who were telling me 45 years later – that you were a terrible person and they understood why Scientology was trying to go after you. I mean, it's incredible. And these were people who had left Scientology. But anyway, the point I was going to make was that the people who were running these operations against you tended to be these zealots who were in the church. The people running the dirty tricks operations today tend to be contractors, right? They, right. Tend, to be, they tend to be professionals that are hired outside people that are hired to, you know, trail Mike Rinder and, and Leah Remini and me. And the one person who really got it bad was Ron Miscavige Sr. Um, and they, so these are, these are more people doing it for the money than because they're personally invested in it. I think that's the big difference. But they, yeah, they are still doing some illegal things today. They're still doing some of the same dirty tricks. But I don't know, you know, that anybody got it quite as bad as you did. No, but the, the internet, now you have the internet. So when they do these terrible things, it is exposed. Whereas when I did them, there really was no way of exposing them because there was no, there was no bulletin board. In those right. Days. Well, there, there, you, although you at the time, you were running a newsletter and you were yes. sending out newsletters trying to educate people. Yeah. I mean, the effort you put in was just, Herculean. It, I'm just blown yeah. away. 16 hours a day. And good. Paul kind of, I, I remember you said something about Paul. Paul, of course, has great respect for all that work. 
but he's kind of glad you're no longer doing that, right? Oh, absolutely. And also at the time that I married him, he was then in charge of acquired movies at Lifetime Television. And he knew that if I continued to fight Scientology and try to expose them, that they were going to go after him as well. Because, you know, they always do that. If they want to get somebody, they go after the people they care about. So he said, you know, when I married you, you're continuing to work against them was not part of the equation. He didn't tell me I couldn't do it, but he was not happy. And I didn't want him to be hurt with all that. So I, I have not done a lot of interviews. And the my memoir is really the first time I've written about it. And I did give you some interviews to help you, you know, with your book. Well, I, I'm glad that you've taken on a lot of different subjects in that, though. And, and so... Picking up our thread there, you, you, you survived the Holocaust, you, you were adopted by the Coopers, um, you went to some good schools, and then uh, explain to my viewers, why, or my listeners, why you tell people you were the original Peggy Olson. From the TV show Mad Men, Paulette. Yeah, I, it's been a long time since... No, I, I, don't, I don't think I had... Use that analogy. Yeah, you we, did. You told me. We, other, the, other than the fact that we all were a bunch of drunks, just like uh, in Mad Men. <laughs> <laughs> no, because what what I what I thought was so funny was the person playing you essentially. This is what the point you made to me was a Scientologist, Elizabeth Ols, Elizabeth oh, right. Moss. Oh right. Okay, Elizabeth Moss. Okay, yeah, I forgot about her. So. But you you were one of the early uh, women uh, copywriters on, on Madison Avenue, right? Yes, I was. I worked at BBBO, and I loved the movie, the TV show Mad Men. And it really, there really was as much drinking <laughs> as they showed. And during the times that I fought Scientology, I really took to, to drinking. I don't now anymore. But boy, that helped me get through. <laughs> <laughs> but then you, what you really wanted to do was was write for magazines, write books. Um, I did. I've written actually, I've written twenty seven books, and other than the scandal of Scientology, and you and I wrote a book together, great book by the way, called Battlefield Scientology, and basically, you wrote most of the chapters, and I wrote the introductions to each of the different sections. And it's, I've only written two things about Scientology out of my 27 books, but uh, the one we did together. And also, you and I have been friends for a long time, but I always jokingly, I, I usually avoid collaborating with someone because I say that my definition of a collaborator is somebody you're no longer talking to. <laughs> <laughs> but but you and I got along just fine. We we did Battlefield Scientology together. We're still friends. I still well, and if I can just divulge, yeah. Uh, yeah. you had approached me and said, "Hey, we should put together a book of some of the best reporting from the underground That's bunker." Right. That's right. And I had I had been thinking something along the lines, but I I I th said, "You know what, Paulette? That is a great idea. I will do it if." you write some introductory essays for the sections, which you agreed. And that was so fun for me was to actually be working with you and having you write those nice, really good pieces to introduce some of the different themes in the book. So yeah, that was a lot of fun to do together. I mean, I still have this blow up of the cover that I revealed at the Chicago uh, Howdy Con uh, on my wall in my den, and I got to tell you, it's just a very proud, you know, proud thing for me to see that cover with my name next to yours. Right. Uh, you know, it's, it's something book. that I never book. would have imagined because, you know, like I said, I I started writing about Scientology in the mid '90s. I was just this nobody in L.A. writing a few stories about Scientology here and there, and I started getting these emails from someone named Paulette. And I and I remember thinking to myself, it can't be, but it was. 
you uh, you were reaching out to me and let me know that you thought I was doing a good job, and I can't tell you how much that meant to me. Mm. You know, I'm just looking at uh, Battlefield Scientology. We had, what is it, five sections. So celebrities in Scientology, Life and Death in Scientology, Fair Game, L. Ron Hubbard in Scientology History, and the Current Scene. And those were the ones I wrote the section to. And they're great articles. One of the problems with blogs is that they generally don't last. You know, people write good things and then it's all forgotten. So I really thought that a lot of the articles that you had written and the research and the investigations that you had done should be something that people could read for many years. And that's why I suggested that we do this book, Battlefield Scientology, together. And we did. Well, I'm glad you suggested it. I, I'm very proud of that book. As, and like I said, I see our names together on the cover, and I'm, <laughs> it just always gives me a thrill. Um, you know, I mean... Look, I, I'll admit it freely. I mean, you're one of my heroes. And this oh. is one of the reasons why I wanted to write your story to begin with. Mm -hmm. But, uh, um, and, and it's not just because you took on Scientology, they threw everything they could at you, and you just gave it right back to them. But, you know, if you get to know Paulette and Paul, these are two people that know how to live. You guys are really enjoying life. And that, you know, that I think that's just wonderful. Yes, we, we're we very happy together, except for the last two years. We didn't go out too much because of the of COVID, but we were fine. You know, we would have all our meals together. We didn't have to go out every night like we used to to enjoy ourselves because he's a lot of fun to be with, and happily he thinks I'm a lot of fun to be with. <laughs> so. So tell me, uh, tell me some other parts of your memoir that uh, maybe people aren't familiar with if they've only read uh, Unbreakable Miss Lovely. Well, there's, there's the opening chapter is the true story of how I successfully stowed away on the Leonardo da Vinci for a week and did not get caught. And uh, then there were the, my years as a tabloid reporter interviewing people like Jackie Onassis, uh, Jackie Kennedy Onassis, and uh, Pat Boone. A lot of major celebrities, Alan Funt, with whom I had an affair afterwards, and uh, Eric Severide, who was then a very, very big uh, announcer on TV. And then I have a section about my years as a travel writer and traveling all over the world and some of my experiences with that. And then, of course, there's the quarter of the book is my years with fighting Scientology, and it's, it's the same story, in a sense, as what you had in your, your book, The Unbreakable Miss Lovely, but told from the standpoint of me, first person. Sure. And a, a little bit more intimate. And uh, then the, my Holocaust past and, you know, how my parents were killed in Auschwitz and being brought up in orphanages and years later. Actually, a couple of very good things happened to me as a result of my fighting Scientology. And the first was the story that you wrote about me for the Village Voice, which was picked up by the largest papers in Belgium and Holland because of my being born in Belgium. And that is how this man contacted me. He read the story, and he your story. And then uh, he realized that he had been told this story by his father, and that it was his father who had bribed the guards to let me out so that I didn't go to Auschwitz. And that was just one week before. And I would have been killed instantly if I had gotten there. And the other good thing that happened because of Scientology was that the lawyer who I met, uh, no, the lawyer who worked on Scientology um, had a party. And Paul, my husband-to-be, was at that uh, was at that party, and I, I had known this guy for many many years, Al, but I would not have been invited to this party, except that we had renewed our friendship when he worked with me on Scientology. So in a sense, I met my wonderful husband because of what happened to me and what I did, and I learned about my past, which for. Decades, I wondered. I mean, I knew that I had been in a Nazi camp, but 
And I knew from records that I was to be sent to Auschwitz, but there was this huge gap. How did I not end up there? So both of those, because of my fight against Scientology and your article, were filled in for me. And that you know gives you a sense of completion when you know what happened to you when you were young, when you wonder for years and years. I'm glad you can see it that way, that Scientology actually uh, benefited you in some ways by coming after you. That's well, they didn't, want to. <laughs> they didn't want to. <laughs> right. The last thing in the world they would have wanted is anything that made me happy. But it did, ultimately. And, and I met wonderful people. I mean, you, of course. But a lot of great people, both when I was fighting and exposing Scientology, and even later, you know, for years, people really didn't know very much about it, and they hadn't heard of it. And now when I tell people that I wrote the first major expose of Scientology, it's always, oh, good for you. Oh, those people are so bad. And everybody seems to know it now. Unfortunately, they always ask me about Tom Cruise, and I don't know, and I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Every once in a while, you read one of these ridiculous articles that he's getting out of Scientology. So people say, is that true? And I say, Yes, Tom Cruise will leave Scientology the same year I get into it. <laughs> <laughs> it's too impossible. So, and now Elizabeth Moss. But then I explain to people that she was born into it. See, what's happening with Scientology now, I believe, is that fewer new people are joining because of the Internet. They know what it's all about. And if they don't, they have friends or parents or relatives who say, you know, are you out of your effing mind? So that keeps a lot of the new people. But the people who have been in, they're not going to get out, especially if they were born in it. I mean, a few of them do, and you write wonderful stories in the underground bunker, interviews with these people. But a lot of them really are very hardcore. And the more people feel that they are attacked, the more cohesive the group becomes. So I don't see a lot of people leaving Scientology. Now, when I first took them on, about 150,000 members. Now I think that you've been estimating 20,000. Yeah. One, one thing I have noticed, too, over the years is that they're trying to expand more and more in countries outside of the U.S. because people here too many know the truth. So they go to these other countries where maybe not as much has been written about it. Right. And maybe I not. think they're also having a hard time in places like Europe and Australia and South Africa. But if they are showing any growth, and I don't think it's a lot, it's in places like Taiwan and Mexico yeah. where the press just isn't paying attention. Right. Well, the press in Taiwan, I think they're primarily concerned with China. And yeah. in, in Mexico, they're primarily concerned with all the people that are dying because of the drug trade. Right. So I, I think a, a cult that sucks a few people in is not primary in their minds. And also you get a lot of Scientology front groups. But many of these, they give themselves away because they say, based on the philosophy of L. Ron Hubbard, well, if you see that on anything that's printed, you know that Scientology is in back of it. Right. It, there's another group called the Moonies that used to be very big at the time that I was fighting Scientology. And they did a better job of hiding because they, they would not mention Reverend Moon. So people didn't know that uh, the school they were sending their kids to was a, a front for the Moonies. But now you send your kids to a school that... They start distributing literature, and it says, based on the writings of L. Ron Hubbard, you know it's Scientology, and you get your kid out as fast as you can. <laughs> exactly, because uh, as we heard from Patty Moyer just a couple of weeks ago on the podcast, she was working with those front groups that actually operate uh, schools and, and right. the curriculum, and she was saying that it's not just that Scientology controls them, but the... Uh, spy wing <laughs> of Scientology controls those front groups. So it's, you know, it's really nefarious mm -hmm. and they try to, they try to pretend that these groups are independent, but they really aren't. Um, yeah. You got to, you got to be wary. They always try to say that people 
for example, the people that attacked me, they would say, oh, they were acting on their own. And uh, we had nothing to do with that. And they're not members of the church anymore. And none of that is true. One of the things we saw when the FBI raided them and took their documents was that all of it was, there were notes from L. Ron Hubbard himself on some of the ways that they were attacking me. And afterwards, yes, they did have them leave technically Scientology, but they're all still Scientologists. That's why they won't talk. And even, I mean, uh, I remember I heard several years ago that there was a, there was literally a Cooper IC. And in Scientology, IC stands for in charge. Mm -hmm. So there was literally a person whose title mm -hmm. was Cooper IC, Cooper in charge, that that, that, that person was in charge mm -hmm. of the unit that was monitoring you, Harassing dreaming me. up operations against you. Yeah. And this, this person had come out of Scientology. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I got very lucky. I, I got to know somebody that knew him. And I got his phone number. And I called him when I was working on the book. And I said, look, I know you're no longer in Scientology, but that you were the Cooper IC, and it would be really great if you could talk to me about the book. I don't, you know, I, I don't need him to like Paulette today, right? We just need him to tell what he knows. And and he he was really rude and just said, she doesn't deserve to have a book written about her, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, that's something. <clears throat> and he just died recently, and so I was able to finally identify him. But uh, apparently, Paulette, he never came around. And I just find that, isn't that incredible? Well, when you tried to call Jerry, the Scientologist I secretly lived with, remember? He said, yes. I, I don't speak the language. I don't know what you're talking about and hung up. Yeah. And, and I mean, we knew we had the right guy. And, and he just pretended that he didn't know anything about it. And uh, uh, that's as far as I got with him. Um you know, people, so there are some people even today, 45 years after these yeah. events, mm -hmm. who are not prepared to talk about the things they did on behalf of the Church of Scientology to try to harm you. And it's way past any statute of limitations. Yeah. You know, you couldn't sue them today. All we want to know is some more details, because even today, there's some things I know when we were going through all this. They kind of puzzle us, like, how did they figure this out about you? How did they figure that out? And it would just be nice to hear from these people and say, oh, yeah, well, I got this source. We looked up this on Paulette, and that's how we knew where she was going to be or whatever. And, you know, I think it's important for people to do that, to come forward, explain what they did. Some people do. You know, I mean, I, I, I really gave Patty Moyer credit when I did her podcast a couple of weeks ago that she was saying I was one of the worst of the worst. It was my job to dig up dirt on people. And, you know, I, I think it's important for people to do that so that we can hear how Scientology operates. Well, they, they don't they don't feel guilty because they don't think they did anything wrong. You know, I still to this day, after all these years, do not know exactly how they got my stationery, which they then wrote bomb threats to themselves on my stationery. I never found out, I was pretty sure that a woman who came to my house and tried to get me to sign something and had a clipboard and that the paper was underneath it and that that's how they got my stationery and my fingerprint on it. And of course, then the FBI thought that I was the one that my fingerprint was on this a bomb threat that I'd never seen in my life. I had always wondered, I was obsessed during that time. And to this day, I still don't know exactly how it went down. And I'd love to know. Well, I, 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 think, I think you're right. I think it was a clipboard. And the reason why I was convinced it was a clipboard is that that operation against you was in December 1972, where they sent somebody to your apartment mm -hmm. pretending she was collecting uh, signatures for uh, Cesar Chavez, I think. Yeah. And wanted you to give a little donation and then sign your name on a petition. <clears throat> that was 1972. Well, in 1976, mm -hmm. they created a whole new operation against you. They called Operation Freakout. Mm -hmm. And that operation is spelled out in beautiful detail in documents that were seized in the FBI raid. 
And in that operation, they spell out how to get your fingerprint on a piece of paper. And it's they, they talked about uh, a guy coming up to you in a bar with a joke on a clipboard, handing it to you to read the joke, hand it back, and then you would have grabbed a piece of paper on the underside of the clipboard. And then the instructions literally talk about how to fold it so that he doesn't introduce his own fingerprint onto the page and that your fingerprint is then taken. So I think the fact that they spelled all that out in 1976 is a pretty good yeah. clue that that's what they did in 1972. Right. I just don't know the specific people involved. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's incredible the lengths they went to, Paulette. I mean, they were they were so determined to try to destroy you. And that's – I, I – I think part of it was that L. Ron Hubbard was a misogynist and it drove him crazy that this, uh, you know, glamorous Manhattan magazine writer um, who, you know, you were not, you were petite, right? Yeah. That this, this, mm -hmm. this petite female magazine writer in Manhattan year after year was causing him so many headaches. I think that drove him crazy. I think you're right, Tony. I remember there was a great deposition that a woman gave in a lawsuit back then. She was on the ship with Hubbard, and she said there was literally a cabin in the ship devoted to the Snow White program. Mm. And in that room was a copy of your book on the shelf. Mm. And and she remembered, she, she testified under oath she remembered hearing Hubbard slam his fist on a desk and scream, that bitch, Paulette. You know who so I, I think he was obsessed with you. Yes, I agree with you. You know who also had a copy of my book in his bedroom next to his bed? Jim Jones. Wow. Yeah. I found out from a woman who had been in Jonestown that he had – my book there, he referred to Scientology as a cult. And there's a very odd audio of him, Jim Jones, the one responsible for Jonestown and all those deaths, talking about me and also saying how terrible I was and how wonderful Scientology was. And he didn't like me because he felt rightly that I was hurting Scientology. But he saw Scientology as a cult, and he didn't, you know, every cult thinks that the other group is a cult. But he didn't see that uh, he was running a cult himself. I wonder if this was one of those cases where they were kind of stuck together because, you know, if they... Yeah, they if, would support each other, but it, they didn't agree that the other was a cult. It was just, well, you know, he's, uh, he's a cult, but I'm not. <laughs> Yeah, we wrote about that at the bunker. There was a there's a recording you can hear. Um, yeah. Jones mm -hmm. was react in 1978. There was a Washington Post story that finally revealed all of these things about the fact that you'd been targeted by Scientology. Mm -hmm. And you know, most people, I think, picking up that story in 1978 and reading that this church mm -hmm. had a spy wing that was trying to destroy people, including a woman named Paula Cooper, I think the reaction for most people would be wow how could this church do such a thing but jim jones yeah. takes the same article and you can hear him on audio talking about oh this paulette cooper why was she trying to bring down a church <laughs> <laughs> so strange to hear that man uttering your name paulette yeah it was it's, it's it's strange but most people who are in cults they they totally deny that they're in cults they don't see it at all and some cults here are political cults, not religious cults. Are you surprised that more than 50 years since your book came out, that, it, that Scientology is still in the news as much as it is today? And I know it's been hurting because of the pandemic, but I mean, it still does have buildings all around the world. Are, are you surprised that 50 years later, Scientology still has the presence it does today? No, because this is true with other cults. There are people that still believe in Jim Jones 
And do you remember this really weird cult called the Bo Peep cult in which they believed that they were going to be resurrected and united with a UFO and the men castrated themselves, the boys? It was a really bizarre case. There are people who still believe in that, uh, the leader. So, no, I'm not surprised. And Scientology took their money, people's money, and they put it into real estate. And they often purchased buildings that, say, had historical significance, important buildings, but they had become run down. And they had a source, they still have, of really cheap labor. I mean, they pay their people, what, 30 cents an hour if they're lucky? And and these people re redo these places for them. So they yeah. have fabulous real estate holdings. They don't need to have a lot of members. They've got huge amount of money. And then, of course, they go after not only celebrities, but they go after whales, people with a lot of money, willing to foolishly give them literally millions of dollars. It really makes you sick when you start reading these. Uh, you, you sometimes run stories about these people. You, you want to shout, idiot, idiot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so maybe it's not so surprising that they're still around. But let me ask you it this way. 50 years after your book came out, are you surprised that the government hasn't done more about the Church of Science? No, I'm not surprised because I saw all during the years that I was fighting them that the government did not go after them. They were not there. They don't want to touch them because they call themselves a religion. So it isn't worth it. Plus, there's a, they used to, when I was fighting them, they were they're so litigious that nobody would touch them. But they're still very, very harassing. And you get, for example, a judge, and he knows that if he just doesn't, if he goes against them, He's going to be harassed, and if he has a mistress or something, they're going to put detectives and find out. And and we had at least one judge whose dog was killed. And they just say, who cares? It's just another, you know. And so they go along with exactly what, uh, you know, the Scientologists want. So I'm not surprised that the government has not uh, gone after them much more than they have. And... Uh what about um, the expose, exposing of Scientology? I mean, when you, when you know, your book came out, and then there were a few others at that period in the seventies. They all got sued out of existence. Right. Another set came out when Hubbard died in eighty six. There were a few books in eighty seven and ninety. They were harmed by Scientology's attempts to, to to bury them, basically. But in the in the last few years. You got Lawrence Wright's book, Janet Reitman's book, uh, Leah Remini's show, HBO's Going Clear. I mean, that is a big difference, isn't it? That, that now the press seems a little less afraid? Absolutely, because what happened is that Scientology was extremely, extremely litigious, but they lost all of these suits, and facts and things came out about them that they did not want, and they realized that this was not a very good direction for them to go. So they stopped suing the press. That doesn't mean they stopped harassing harassing the people, uh, the reporters and the, uh, the media themselves. But at least, so people were less afraid. And also, you know, we have something that's come about called self-publishing, meaning that you don't have to go to a major publisher to write an interesting book. I mean, our battlefield Scientology, we published ourselves. My right. per Perils of Fallout, I published it myself. And that makes a big difference also. Now, there were some excellent books done by, you know, uh, Larry Wright and uh, Janet Reitman. And, but they went to major publishers. After a few books, publishers are saying, oh, it's already been written about. And it would be hard to get, at this point, another major book by a major publisher. So, but that's enabled a lot of people to tell their stories, and there really there must be how many how many uh, first person stories do you book? No, I know there's some great new ones out. I mean, yes. I love Mark Headley's book, and they've been wonderful. And they've been wonderful ones. Jefferson Hawkins and and Amy Scobie and right. uh, I've uh, read many you know. of them. They're really very good. Whereas at the time that I had my book, there was 
George Malkos, who was not negative at all to Scientology. And there was a guy named Robert Kaufman. And he came out with a book around the time I did. His was a first person story. But what happened is that he ended up in a mental institution, which he blamed on Scientology's techniques and what they did to him. But they were able to dismiss him and his book by saying, well, he's crazy. He was in a mental institution. And in my case, I didn't have a background where they could say bad things about me. So they had to create it and right. write themselves these bomb threats and have me arrested so that they could say, see, she's a felon and she's insane. Right. And let's uh, point out something else. So your your book, Scandal Scientology, came out in 1971. Robert's book, uh, Inside Scientology, came out in 1972. And let's give him one credit he very much deserves because people think of this as coming out many years later in the LA times and things. Robert Kaufman is the first person who published the name Zenu in his book in 1972. Now, not a lot of people saw it then and didn't, you know, wasn't, you know, become a big part of the press or anything that came later, but let's give him credit. He was the first one to reveal some of those upper level secrets in print um, but it's, I mean, this is the kind of thing I'm fascinated by is this whole publishing history. And now we have a new book, Paulette, please give us that title again. So people can find it. What is the title of your memoir? The Perils of Paulette, my life as a stowaway, tabloid reporter, travel writer, Scientology basher, Holocaust survivor, and more. And I hope people find it. Uh, you will be amazed at the many lives lived by Paulette <laughs> Cooper. And uh, and uh, I hope you can see what a delight she is. Paulette, thank you so much for taking the time to help us out with this. Thank you, Tony. I always enjoy talking with you. <laughs> okay, talk to you later. Now I'm bunker down in bunker town again, again, again to witness history. All right.